be talking about something we've been talking about for several weeks now. I've done lost count how many weeks we've been talking about this. And you might scratch your head and wonder, well, Pastor, how much longer are we going to be on it? Mm -hmm. Well, considering the fact that I do not pick and choose my topics, I let the Lord do that. I can't answer that question except to let you know that we will be on it until the Lord moves us on to something else. Mm -hmm. We've been talking about Hebrews, the 11th chapter. And by now, those of you that are here, those of you that are listening by radio and by YouTube and Facebook and all the different the podcasts, CDs, cassettes, however it is you're listening to this, you can probably already quote it. But we've been talking about Hebrews, the 11th chapter, and how that it teaches us how the elders obtained a good report, and how that the Word of God teaches us plainly the only way we will obtain a good report is the same way they did, through faith. Hebrews, the 11th chapter, and the first two verses is all I'm going to read in that chapter today. It says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And we hear that quoted a lot. That's one of the foundational scriptures of the Pyre movement, the Pentecostal movement, cut their teeth on. The next verse says, For by it... The elders obtained a good report. By what? By the faith that it's talking about in verse 1. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtained a good report. Only one way to obtain a good report with God today. And that is faith. We have read the Scriptures, the just shall live by faith. We have read the Scripture that it is impossible to please God without faith. We talked about Enoch and how that he pleased God. And then we found out how he pleased God. It was because he had faith. Enoch walked with God and Enoch was not. Because he had faith in God. Because his faith was not in himself. And that's what we've been talking about. Faith in the flesh will always let you down. If you're counting on your flesh to get you into heaven, you're counting on a broken stick. Amen? There's only one means of justification. This is what we've been talking about. The just living by faith. Without faith is possible. Please God, there's only one means of justification and righteousness and holiness today. And that is faith in the shed blood of Jesus Christ and His finished work. We've been learning how that the entirety of the Word of God. Brother Billy, really you mean you're finding stuff about Jesus and His blood in the Old Testament? I thought that didn't happen till the words, the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise. Oh no. This has been coming a long time. There have been hundreds if not thousands of types and shadows of Jesus Christ and the sacrifice that He would make. We find in the Old Testament that the saints then were saved the same way that we're saved today. They were saved by faith. It was just from a little different view. It was faith in the same thing. It was faith not in the, not in the, the blood of that earthly lamb that was born, but what it represented. The picture and the type and the shadow that it was. When that priest entered into the Holy of Holies on that one day of the year, the Day of Atonement, and he applied the blood to the mercy seat, it wasn't necessarily the blood that he took in there of that earthly lamb. But it was the blood that that earthly lamb's blood represented. The blood of Jesus Christ. The Savior to come. The promised one. As far as we have record of, promised all the way in the back, in, in, into, the, into the, uh, the front of the book of Genesis. Whenever he, God prophesies it himself to Adam and Eve after the fall. And we see time and time again pictures of that which was to come. Listen to me. Get this straight. When you get to heaven and you're walking on streets of gold and you begin to converse and talk with the saints of old and you talk with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and you talk to David and you talk to all of the great patriarchs of old, you will not find different stories of, well, how did you get here? Well, I got here by the law. I got here because of my good works. I got here because of the things that I did. Oh, no. Every man, woman, and child from Adam to the last man standing will get to heaven one way. And that is faith in Jesus Christ. Before the cross, they had faith in that which was to come. 
Today we stand on this side of it having faith in that which was accomplished on Calvary's cross 2,000 years ago when Jesus said it is finished. Everyone that ever went to heaven or ever will get there. One way. Only one door. Always has been. Always will be. We see it all the way from Genesis all the way to the end of Revelation. It is the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Faith in that is the only way you will get there. When you sit down at the marriage supper of the Lamb with Abraham and talk to him about how he made it through, it'll be faith in the Lamb that was to come. As him and Isaac, and we talked about Abraham, as him and Isaac walked up that hill that day, and Isaac said, Father, where is the sacrifice? And Abraham said, Son, God will provide himself a lamb. And whenever he strapped Isaac down on that altar and he began to, he drew back the knife to smite him. He heard a noise. An angel says, stop, don't do it. And he turns and he sees a ram caught in the thicket. And God shows us a picture of the substitute for mankind for the sacrifice that had to be made. So we see it in Abraham. Jesus even told the Jews, told the Pharisees of that day, he said, Abraham saw my day and rejoiced in it. Mm -hmm. They said, what are you talking about? Because Abraham had seen it through the eyes of faith. Mm -hmm. The promise had been made. The faith was in the fulfillment of the promise that was to come. Today our faith is in the promise that was fulfilled on Calvary's cross. We talked about Adam and Eve and how that they, when they sinned in the garden, the first thing they did was try to cover it up with their own works. And man has been doing that ever since. We want to be able to save ourselves. I was talking this morning before service. Mom brought it up how that when Eve and Adam fell, that they begin to blame it on someone else. And we've talked about this a thousand times, how Adam said, Lord, it's the woman that you gave me. And then Eve, she said, well, it was the serpent. And man still has that problem today because man wants to justify himself. When I mess up, I don't want to fess up and say I'm the one that did it. Amen? I want to blame it on somebody else. I want to say that I would have done things different if it hadn't been for Brother Tyler. I would have done things different if it hadn't been for Brother Sleece. I would have done things different, God, if circumstances hadn't known that He is the head over all things and that all things work together for my good. We not only point the finger at our brother and sister, we point the finger at God. Because we don't want to take the blame and the shame that comes with the fact that we messed up. So man always trying to blame it on something else. And we see there in the Garden of Eden how that whenever man messed up, the first thing they did was, here, let's hurry. Let's get us some fig leaves and sew them together. We'll cover ourselves. And that was okay till God showed up. You'll think your righteousness is pretty good mm -hmm. till God yeah. shows up. Yeah. I mean, you th now listen, you might be able to compare your righteousness to me and feel pretty good. You might think, well, I fast. You remember we talked about the the uh, the publican and the uh, was it a Pharisee that went up into the temple and the Pharisee said, "I'm glad I'm not like him." He compared himself to the publican and he said, "I fast more than he does." And you might be able to compare yourself to Brother Billy this morning and feel pretty good. You might say, "Well, I pray more than he does. I fast more than he does. I read more than he does. I study more than he does. I, I pray more. I'm a really, I'm really righteous compared to him." But you wait till you go to comparing yourself to God. Wait till God shows up, and then your righteousness really shows up as the filthy rag that it really is. Amen. So you might feel good comparing yourself to somebody else, but wait till. And that's the way Adam and Eve were. They sold the fig leaves together, and. It doesn't say anything about them being ashamed. It doesn't say anything about them hiding until here comes God. When God shows up to see, that's the way many people. On the day of judgment, that's the way it's going to be for many. In this life, they put their faith in their own works. They put their faith in their own deeds. They put their faith in the written law and their ability to keep that. And they think that will justify them or make them righteous. And they may, it does make your flesh feel good. In this life, if you do good things, it makes you feel good. But when you stand before God, the best works that man has to offer is not good enough. 
And we learned that with Cain and Abel. Cain didn't bring some piffly little old thing. He brought the best he had. Abel brought a blood offering and it was accepted by God. Cain brings the best of the fruit that he has. The best thing that he can offer within himself. The work of his hands. Mm -hmm. And it's rejected of God. Mm -hmm. The best you have. The best you will ever have. The best anyone that has ever walked the face of God's green earth has ever had. Is not good enough when compared to His holiness. His righteousness. If you intend to stand before God and boast in your own goodness, you're in for a very rude awakening. Because when you stand in the presence of a holy God, you will find out just how insignificant your efforts really were. Now, not taking anything away from works. Works is a good thing. It's good to live right. It's good to do good works. But not if that's where your faith is and for your, for your salvation and your justification. Because that will not sanctify you, Brother Tyler. That will not justify you. We do good works because we're saved. We don't do good works in order to save us. Amen? The tree brings forth the good fruit. The fruit does not bring forth the tree. You can't get the cart before the horse. We are saved unto good works. Good works will not save you. Then we learned about the blood on the doorpost that dark night in Egypt. How that no matter how good of a person you were, without that blood being applied to your house, death was going to make a stop. Death was going to visit your house that night. Judgment was going to come to your house. And we learned how that even though there were some Egyptians... I guarantee you there were some Egyptians that were better than some of the Israelites. Like I told you, the Israelites were not perfect. We find that out real quick. They haven't even made it but just out to the bank of the Red Sea, Mama. And Pharaoh's behind them. And you know what they're doing? They're complaining and saying, well, why'd you bring us out here to die, Moses? We were better off back there in Egypt eating the onions and the garlic. We were better off back there instead of having our graves out here in the wilderness. So we see it don't take very long till we find out some of them were not perfect. But Jesus, but, but the Word of God didn't say, when I see you, I will pass over you. He said, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. When I see the blood, judgment will be, will, will, will bypass your house. Judgment will not be visited upon you because when I see the blood, I'll know the price has already been paid. Oh, hallelujah. That's the way, same way it is with us today, Brother Sleep. When he sees the blood, he'll know that the price has already been paid for us and we will not have to suffer the judgment for that. When I see the blood, I will pass over you. You will be protected. Not when I see how good you are. Not whenever I see your works. Not whenever I see your deeds. But when I see the blood. When He sees me today. He sees the blood of the Lamb. He sees me as worthy. And not as I am. By faith the elders obtained a good report. By faith we today obtain a good report. And we see time and time again. Pictures and shadows of the promised one who was to come. And the faith of those Old Testament saints and patriarchs that had their faith in that that was to come. Today I want you to turn with me to the book of Luke. The book of Luke, the 17th chapter. Luke 17. And we're going to start in the 24th verse. You can find this over in Matthew, the 24th chapter, where Jesus is telling about the signs of the end of time and of His coming. But I wanted to read it here in Luke. I like the wording just a little bit better. And it brings out a little bit something that's not in the book of Matthew. Luke 17 and 24 says, For as the, these are the words of Jesus, speaking of his coming, speaking of the last days, for as the lightning that lighteneth, that lighteneth out of the one part under heaven shineth unto the other part under heaven, so shall also the Son of Man be in his day. But first must he suffer many things and be rejected of this generation. 
And as it was in the days of Noah, the Bible actually here says Noah, but it's Noah who he's talking about. As it was in the days of Noah, so shall it also be in the days of the Son of Man. Matthew says, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. As it were, it was in the days of Noah. He says they did eat, they did drink, they married, they were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. Now, as it was in the days of Noah, and we talk about this, we have, we have talked about this before and you hear this a lot, when we talk about the last days, we talk about how evil the world was for God to bring a flood to destroy all of, all, the, all, the, all of mankind and all the living creatures. As a matter of fact, the Bible tells us that God saw the wickedness of man in that day, talking about in the days of Noah, that He saw their wickedness and that every imagination of the thoughts of His heart was only evil continually. The thoughts of the heart of man during the days of Noah, right before the flood, his thoughts were on evil continually. You're talking about a wicked and perverse generation. So much so that God said, It repented the Lord that He made man on the earth and it grieved Him at His heart. God said, I'm sorry I even made him. It's such a mess. So when Jesus is speaking over there in Matthew and in Luke and the Gospels there, and He says, as it was in the days of Noah, we know that in the days of Noah it was wicked. We know that in the days before the flood it was, it was wicked. It was, it was ungodly. And we see that today in our society. I don't know if it's as, as bad, but it's got to be pretty close. Because we've got homosexuality. No longer is it a shame and considered a sin, but now... It is waved, their flag is waved and marched down the center streets of our country. And not just that, but abortion and adultery and fornication. And the list goes on and on. The pornography that is spewed out of Hollywood and that is so, makes millions of dollars, if not billions of dollars a year on pornography. Men's hearts and their thoughts on wicked and evil continually. So we see that as it was in the days of Noah that Jesus is speaking of. We see how that in the last days wickedness will abound. That there will, be, there will be wickedness and ungodliness and there will be great sin upon the earth. But what else? If you go to Genesis the 6th chapter and the 8th verse. I don't want to get into it in a hurry. I'm going to read you these, the three verses that precede that. And God saw that the wickedness of man. I'm in Genesis the 6th chapter. Beginning of the fifth verse. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart were on evil, evil continually. And he repented the Lord that he made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. Verse 7 says, And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, and the creeping thing, and the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them. That's Genesis 6 and 7. We drop down to the very next verse. So we see that there, were, there was evil. We see that there was wickedness. We see that it grieved. I believe it grieves God's heart today when America aborts her babies. I believe that sin still grieves God's heart. I believe that wickedness still grieves the heart of God. Verse 8 says this. So we see the wickedness, but what else do we see? Genesis 6 and 8. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Now I know we like to talk about the dispensation of the law, and we like to talk about the dispensation of grace. And you have those that believe that in the Old Testament they were saved by the law. We have those that believe that in the New Testament we are saved by grace. They don't realize how they both walk hand in hand and how they work together and that it's been grace since the beginning of time. Noah found grace. This amazing grace that saved you is about to save Noah and his family. <laughs> this amazing grace that we speak about and talk about on this side of the cross 
And we talk about how that, that God's amazing grace has brought us this far and will safely see us through. It's that same grace that saves Noah and his family. It's that same grace that saved the world. Because had it not been for the grace of God, Noah and his family would have been destroyed as well. So God sees Noah and Noah finds grace in the eyes of the Lord. Was there sin and wickedness? Oh yes, but there was grace. There was sin, there was filth on every hand, but grace, oh God's marvelous grace was there. Notice back in Luke, the 17th chapter, it said that Jesus, Jesus spoke there and He said that He, talking of Himself, would be rejected of this generation. Today, He is rejected of this generation. He is rejected more and more as we get closer to the end, the more this world rejects Jesus Christ. We find the same thing going on there in the book of Genesis with Noah. The Bible teaches us that for 120 years, Noah preached righteousness. He preached that there was only one way of escape. Say, Brother Billy, how in the world do you tie this into faith in the finished work of the cross? I'm getting there. I ain't going to hold you much longer. He preached that there was only one way to escape the judgment to come. And that message was rejected by that generation. For 120 years, God allowed His Spirit to deal with the heart of men through the message that, that Noah was preaching. As he built this humongous boat, we're not talking about something that was done in secret. God gives Noah specific instructions on what to build and how to build it. Preacher, do you believe that the ark was literal, that the flood was literal? You better believe I do because the Bible says so. Well, I just don't see. Well, I don't care whether you don't see it or not. The Bible says it. That settles it. Your opinion don't matter to the hill of beans when compared to the Word of God. So, we see that this thing that, that God does in this, with this generation of Noah right before the flood is not a secret thing. As a matter of fact, He tells Noah, you build an ark. And Noah begins building. And while he's building, he's proclaiming the message. Judgment's coming. Judgment's coming. There's only one means of salvation. There's only one way to be saved from the judgment to come. And while he's doing that, he's out there driving the nails. He's out there getting this humongous... One historian said that it was 450 feet long, 75 feet wide, and 45 feet high. Higher than a three-story building. 450 foot long. So you don't believe that the people of that day weren't seeing what was going on? They could see this massive structure that this man and his family were building. And no doubt word spread to the uttermost part. As far as the, the people went, the word spread. There's a man over here saying judgment's coming. There's a man over here saying there ain't but one way to, 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 uh, to get out of this judgment that's fixing to be poured out. There's only one way. You see, there wasn't going to be Noah over here building the boat and Jethro over yonder building the boat and somebody over there building the boat and you were going to be able to pick and choose which one you got on. There was one way, one way of escape for this judgment, this flood that God was getting ready to pour out. There's no, there's no several ways of salvation today. You cannot be one saved by grace, one saved by works, one saved by the law. You will come this one way. This ark that Noah was building was a picture and a type of the one way of escape that God had promised mankind from the beginning of time there in the book of in the Garden of Eden, there in the first part of the book that we're reading from today. God had promised there is a seed coming that will destroy, that will bruise the head of the serpent and destroy the kingdom of darkness. This is the one way. This is a picture. Judgment's coming. As sure as it was in the, there in the, in the dark streets of Egypt that night, judgment was coming. And there was only one way to be saved from that judgment. As sure as it is with Noah in that day, the judgment was coming. He was getting ready to be poured out by God to destroy all of mankind. And there was only one way of escape. Just as sure as that, today judgment is coming. And there's only one way to escape. And that is faith in Jesus Christ. And this ark was a picture and a type of the way, the finished work of, of Jesus on the cross, the way that He would make for us to escape judgment. So the whole time that Noah is building, he's preaching the wrath of God. 
Judgment's coming. There's only one way to escape it. Better get on the boat. There's only one way to escape it. Better get on the ark. So it is today with the message of His finished work. It was not a secret. Noah, God didn't say, okay, Noah, I want you to build this just for you and your family and do it somewhere where people can't see. No, it was right out in the open. He's out there building this humongous vessel and he's preaching. Judgment's coming. There's only one way. So it is today as we look back at the cross. The cross was not done in secret. You see, Jesus could not have been killed somewhere out of the sight of the public. And then say, hey, did you hear what happened to Jesus? I heard that he was poisoned. They wanted to kill him, trust me, before he ever made it to the cross. They would have. They could have got their hands on him. There were times whenever he went through the crowd and disappeared out of their midst because they wanted to get their hands on him. But this thing had to be done in the open. This thing had to be... God would make this such an event that the Son of Almighty God would hang between heaven and earth on a cross in front of all of Jerusalem. And not just that, God Himself would pull the curtains of heaven. He would darken the sky. He would shake the earth with an earthquake. And He would rip the temple veil in twain from top to bottom. Yes. This thing was not done in a corner. This thing was shouted from the rooftops. God showed all of the world, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And the sacrifice was accepted when the temple veil was rent in twain. And faith in that is the only means of escape from the judgment to come. In Noah's day, getting on the ark was the only way of escape. Today, coming by the blood is the only way of escape. The whole time Noah, Noah never built a boat before. There wasn't no need for it. It had never rained. He'd never built a boat, never been a flood before. But he put his faith in what God had said. God gave him specific instructions. God has given us specific instructions today. And from Genesis to Revelation, they all point to one thing. Specific instructions. You don't have to follow them if you don't want to. Like Brother Slee says, you have a right to go to hell if you want to go to hell. You can choose to go to hell if you want to go to hell. But God has given us specific instruction. There is only one means of salvation from the judgment to come. You, and you, listen, in that day as Noah built his boat and as he preached that there's only one way of escape, only one, that's what we've been preaching. There's only one way of justification. There's only one way of sanctification. There's only one way to get out of this thing, and that is through the blood of Jesus. <clears throat> so here stands this ark, this massive vessel that Noah's been building on. And he's preaching. You better get on it. You better do what God has said. You better turn back to God before it's too late. Preacher of righteousness. There's only one way to escape the judgment that's coming. I'm sure in that day there were scoffers. They would scoff at his work. They would make fun of him. They would laugh. They'd go on about their business. <laughs> That's crazy. No, well, he's been working on that thing for 40 years. He's been saying that same message for 40 years. He's been saying that same thing for 80 years. He's been saying that same thing for 120 years. And then it begins to rain. It begins to drop. The rain begins to drop. And while he's doing this, I'm sure there were those, as many people as there were, I would probably say this and it would be, and it would be without any contradiction. <clears throat> the scoffers, maybe some of them decided to find the highest hill they could find. Well, even if he is right, I'll build my house on this highest hill and I'll make it. I don't need Noah. I don't need his silly old message and I don't need that crazy looking boat or whatever that is thing he's building. I'll find me a high I'll find me the highest hill and I'll be okay. Many would declare, oh, well, that can't be the only way of escape. Has to be another way besides that. Maybe some of them thought, I'm, I'm a good person. God ain't gonna destroy me. I'm a good person. I'll just I'll just lay on I'll just I'll just trust in that. I'm a good person. 
It ain't going to happen to me. It might happen to the other people. I can see how he'd do that to old Bob, that drunkard. But surely not me. So some had their faith in their own selves, but the end result would be the same. They would come by way of the ark, or they would not be saved from the judgment to come. Today you will come by way of the old rugged cross and the finished work of Jesus, or you will not be saved from the wrath to come. You may be out there today and you may be thinking that God won't judge me. God doesn't judge. God's a, he's a God of love. Probably had some of them preachers in that day. While Noah's preaching righteousness and preaching you better get on the boat, probably had some of them loony ticks over there that were saying, He's a God of love. He ain't going to destroy you. He's not going to judge you. Feels good, do it. There were probably a few of those back in those days. God will judge sin. And if you have not accepted the price that Jesus paid, if that's not where your faith is at, then your sins have not been judged or paid for. And you will pay for your sins yourself. You will suffer, maybe I should put it this way, you will suffer the judgment that is coming unless you put your faith and your trust in the fact that Jesus already took your judgment for you. You're not good enough You'll never be good enough. There are no amount of works. There is no amount of self-righteousness that can cause you to be holy before God. We cannot put our faith in our flesh and say, I'll live this thing on my own. No. You'll come by way of the cross and His finished work or you won't get there at all. So God gives Noah specific instructions. He tells him what kind of wood to use. He tells him the measurements. He tells him exactly what to build in order to escape. God has given us specific instructions today. And that's what we've been talking about. Those instructions are to put your faith in Jesus Christ and His finished work. Only one way to escape the judgment to come. God has given us instruction in His Bible and all of the Word of God points to one means of salvation, one means of justification by faith in Jesus Christ. Whether you were in the Old Testament looking ahead, whether you're on this side of the cross, in this church age, looking back at the finished work, knowing that God has done it. And it, faith, not in what you can do, but what He has done. Not in how good you are, but how good He is. Knowing that He has done what you could not, that no man could keep the law, that no flesh can be justified by the law, that, that justification must come by faith in Jesus Christ and what He did. The temple veil. There's only one time the Word of God records that the temple veil was rent in twain. That's when Jesus Christ said it is finished. And the veil was rent in twain, letting us know that now we could go into the Holy of Holies, into the presence of God. But there was only one way to do it, and that is through what Jesus had just done on the cross of Calvary. The temple veil was not written in twain when He was resurrected. As powerful as the resurrection was, the work was done on the cross. The work was done on the cross. It doesn't say that on the third day or on that first day of the week when they went, the tomb rolled away and Jesus came forth and the temple veil was written in twain. No <clears throat> The temple veil was rent in twain when he said it was finished from the top of the cross and he gave up the ghost when the blood of the Lamb was shed on the authoritative altar of the cross of Calvary and is putting our faith in that. Well, I don't feel saved. Feel don't have nothing to do with it. I, 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 I haven't lived like I need to live. Well, you yeah, joined the crowd. None of us have. Does it condone sin? No, but it certainly gives us the, not just the hope, but the fact that if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. Today, justification comes by one means, and that is Jesus Christ and His shed blood and faith in that. Galatians 2.16. I'm closing. This is the last scripture I'll give you today. Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by faith of Christ. Not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. No way of being justified by the works of the law. Only through the shed blood of Jesus Christ.
in His finished work. Someone else this morning have something before we go? Be sure and 